Well, there were questions that were quite legitimate to ask. They have not been answered specifically by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or as the New York Times dubbed them way back, never a straight answer because they were not getting answers to legitimate questions. And nor was I, and nor a lot of other people. And a friend of mine did a, a film about 20 years ago, and he interviewed the PR chap at NASA. At that time, it was Brown Welch, who subsequently died. Uh, this is back in the late 90s. And he was asked various questions on camera. And his answer was, we don't have enough time for this nitpicky claptrap, which seems a very unprofessional type of answer even to the point of denying anything that was being suggested. Anyway, the more I went on, the more I discovered that there were a lot of other people interested in finding the answers to this. Did it happen the way we've been shown, or was there another story? And the more I've gone on, the more I've discovered that there appears to be another story. You have to go back to the time that this was occurring. This is the late 1960s, early 1970s. Apollo its major expenditure was in the mid-1960s, when it apparently uh, devoured 4% of American budget. So what you've got is a huge number of people involved in an extraordinarily complex operation. So if there was any misgivings going on, surely these people would have known about it. That's a very logical thing to think, until you start looking into the whole aspect of what was actually going on. Bear in mind, this is the height of the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. This was also the height of the Vietnam War. It was also the, the height of the space race. Who could get to the moon first? They were the first to reach the moon in 1959, unmanned craft. They photographed the back of it, and it was considered to be quite an achievement. Then they had the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, in April 1961. When all this was going on, of course, there was a new president in America, John Kennedy. He'd only been in office about four months at the time of Yuri Gagarin's flight. He had to be seen to be doing something. He'd already had to endure the Bay of Pigs fiasco. So here he was, four months later, new president. Right, we're not going to land a man on the moon before the decade is out, return him safely to the Earth. It was such a dramatic announcement that we can still quote it almost verbatim today but he had to be seen to be doing something. But the only experience that Americans had in space, putting humans into space at that time, was Alan Shepard, who'd gone up on Freedom 7, one of the Mercury craft. He'd gone up about 100 miles and come straight back down again, about 15 minutes in space. And now we're going to land on the moon. Right, it was still nine years in the future. But nine years isn't a long time in space exploration. There's a lot of things to overcome. So from a standing start, America land on the moon, July 1969. So what we've got here, a fairly extraordinary technical achievement. But was it that extraordinary? Or was it something that we maybe can ask questions about? Maybe that's what we'll do now. That's the best thing to do here. Here, Marcus has questions. Blue, you may have answers. So let's see. We have been experimenting with rocketry ever since Operation Paperclip when we got all the rocket scientists from Germany. and all the way back to like 1950s. I have a video myself of us sending rockets up into space and taking pictures of Earth dating back to 1955. And to say that we had a standing start when within nine years made it up kind of ignores all the missions that it took to get to Apollo, including Mercury and Gemini. So what do you think about Mercury and Gemini? What's your opinion on that? Oh, absolutely. The way we were told it happened. Just one point on those rockets. Mercury, uh, Gemini, were only going into Earth orbit, about 200 miles up. Nobody had actually left Earth orbit. Nobody had achieved escape velocity. I'm curious as to what you think, what's preventing humans from making it to the moon if they made it to low Earth orbit? Okay, getting into low Earth orbit is relatively easy. I say relatively, it's not that simple. It requires a great deal of technical ability to even get into Earth orbit, and that's only 200 miles up. We're not talking a great deal of distance. Getting to the moon, let's say in round numbers, quarter of a million miles away, many thousands of times further away. There are a great many obstacles to overcome, not least of which is escape velocity. Going into Earth orbit, you achieve 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, and you go into orbit around the Earth. It takes an hour and a half to go around, and you can do that for as long as you like. 
is not difficult. Getting to the moon, you've got to accelerate from Earth orbit speed at 25,000 miles an hour. Now, the inverse square law comes in at this point. It's not just a matter of increasing your speed by 50%. You've got to double the energy required to do it. So you've got to carry a lot more fuel. Therefore, you've got to have a bigger rocket. Sure, Operation Paperclip scientists, Werner von Braun being one of them, had developed rockets in the you know, early 1940s. I know because he fired two and a half thousand of them at London with a ton of explosive on the top. They were extremely unpleasant things. I wasn't old enough to experience them exploding because I was evacuated out of London. And Werner von Braun could build these things, but they didn't go any higher than Earth orbit, maybe 200 miles up. Getting to the moon is a completely different story. It requires a great deal more energy in the rocket, which means a great deal larger rocket, hence the Saturn V, because it had the five F1 engines. That was only the first part. When that thing launched, and it did launch, I'm not disputing the launch mm -hmm. of the Saturn V, any of the Saturn Vs, they all launched. We saw them launch, a million people watched Apollo 11, but about two minutes after it launched, the rocket disappears from view. How do we know what happened next? We have to rely on the word of NASA to tell us what happened next. They're the only people who had the ability to tell us. There were no independently verifiable witnesses. There are people who will claim that ham radio operators listened in. There will be people who claim that they have photographs showing the rockets leaving Earth orbit. A bit of a strange thing to be able to claim because the rockets are a long way away. I would dispute that real quick. You know, recently to SpaceX, the car that got launched into space by SpaceX and Elon Musk, well, that was found by amateur astronomers observing it on its way out of um, Earth's orbit. Elon Musk was particularly keen that people did that, so he told everybody exactly the trajectory on which the rocket was going. Well, it's one way to find a car, so it'll, it'll get to Mars eventually, I'm told, and uh, they'll probably find it there. Hopefully it'll land in one piece. Escape velocity. So you don't actually have to reach, as far as I know, escape velocity of the Earth in order to make it to the moon. You only have to reach enough speed in order to get within the moon's orbit. There's a very informative simulation software out there called Kerbal Space Program in which you can actually test this theory yourself. And you can send a rocket up and you don't have to reach escape velocity. You can use the Earth's gravitational field as a slingshot to send you up into the moon and it takes drastically less energy into it to do so. In fact, we know how fast the CSM went, which was 11.08 kilometers per second, or for us Americans, 24,791 miles per hour. And when you do it, that is enough in order to get there. The Saturn V could accomplish that speed. Oh yeah, of course it yes. could. That's what we watched and that's what we're told happened. There are no independently verifiable evidence, but uh, let's leave that because we'll come back to that. Okay, when the Saturn V rockets left Earth orbit, or left Earth, what speed is it doing when it reaches the moon? So in the traveling from Earth to the moon, and of course when you calculate speed it's all relative. So between the Earth and the moon it is traveling at 24,791 miles per hour, or 11.08 kilometers per second, which is blistering fast. But once it reaches the moon, it will catch inside of its orbit, and then it will slow down. They did a burn once they got into the moon's gravitational field to slow itself down and then just orbit the moon like that. If that's the case, and it left Earth at 25,000 miles an hour, and mm -hmm. the moon is a quarter of a million miles away, why didn't it take 10 hours to get there? It took three days, 72 hours. The point is that it was slowing down all the way to the moon. It was being dragged back by the Earth's gravity. Sorry, I did misspeak. You're right. That is true. It was being dragged back. They don't have to burn their engines the entire time over going there. No, no, they don't. In fact, yeah. they didn't because the speed they were leaving Earth at is the speed that they would be required to reach the gravitational neutral point between Earth and the Moon. It's about 20,000 miles yeah. off yeah. the Moon's surface. Yeah. yeah, it starts to be accelerated by the gravity of the Moon. So it goes into orbit around the moon during about 6,000 miles an hour. It takes about an hour and a half to orbit the moon. Because they're all running on minimums. They're trying to get the minimum speed to make it to the moon. Everything is minimum to save as much energy as possible. And it seems like you accept all that. Oh yeah, that's, absolutely. Yeah. That's basic physics. My question would be, if we have the rocket to get us there, and we have the math to get us there, why didn't we go there? Okay. How do we know we did go there? 
this right. is where I'm going to state that I don't have the burden of proof. Let's talk about Apollo 11 because that's what most people are familiar with. That's fine with me. Most of the information that people will be familiar with are from the photographs that were taken on the lunar surface. In total, in Apollo 11, there were 121 photographs taken on the lunar surface. For all the six missions that landed, and there were six that landed, there were another three that didn't land, that orbited the moon, there were 5,171. There's quite a lot of photographs, so let's have a look at the camera that took these photographs. Now, what we got here are four photographs. They are showing the Hasselblad lunar camera that took these photographs that mm -hmm. we're all familiar with. Now, there are a few points to bear in mind about this camera. For a start, it has no viewfinder. But on the Hasselblad, is normally on top of the camera, so you look down into it. But if you're wearing a spacesuit and a helmet, you can't get your head down far enough to look into the viewfinder. So it took it away. So there's no mirror. So there's no sound. So how do you know if you've taken a photograph? Bottom right-hand image, there are three dials. The center dial is the film counter, which tells you how many photographs have been taken. Bottom left, the little black square on the front of the camera is the shutter. The shutter button on Hasselblad is always on the front of the camera. Because they were going to be using armored gauntlets on their uh, spacesuit, they had to have a big enough shutter button to be able to press it. But they couldn't see it from inside the spacesuit. Bit of a problem, that. They don't know if you've taken a photograph, you can't see the shutter to press it. The lens on the front of the camera is a manual lens. Now this may all sound terribly 20th century and old fashioned, but this was not a point and shoot camera. It was not an automatic camera. The only automatic function it had was to wind the film on. After you take an image, the film would automatically be moved forward. By the batteries on the top right, you'll see the batteries underneath the camera. They're standard, made by Varta in this case, D2 style batteries. Mm -hmm. On the lens, there are three dials which have to be adjusted for every photograph. There's a focus ring, the shutter speed ring, that's the F 160th, F 125th, F 250th, or the aperture setting, that's the F 5.6, F 8, F 11. Each of those has to be set. If you change your view, you have to focus it. It's a wide angle lens, slight wide angle lens, 60 millimeter biogon lens, but you still have to focus it. Now, the point is that if you can't see what you're photographing, because you haven't got a viewpoint, you've got to point the camera in the general direction of what you want to photograph. How do you know you're not going to cut somebody's head off? Now, these are all highly trained astronauts, but they're not necessarily highly trained photographers. They know how to operate the camera because they've been using them quite a long time when they were walking around photographing their family in the barbecue. But they had a lot of other things to do when they're on the moon. Not just take photographs. They had to collect rocks, they had to set, put the flag up, they had to talk to the president, they had to walk around, they had to make sure the video camera was set up properly, they had to make sure the film camera was working properly. So you've got all these restrictions on use, and in the two hours, 21 minutes that Armstrong was on the lunar surface, he took most of the photographs. And have you actually seen a photograph of Neil Armstrong on the lunar surface? There is supposedly one. But that's all. Most of the pictures show Buzz Aldrin. They did have two cameras, one for each astronaut, but they only used one, which seemed a bit peculiar. Now, there's another problem that arises here. We mentioned that these were taken with photographic film. They were not digital cameras. Photographic film cannot work in a vacuum. It's destroyed. It becomes too brittle. It outgasses. The emulsion on the film outgasses. The film itself becomes very, very brittle. Now, how do we know this? Right. About 18 months ago, I attended a talk in London given by the designer of the camera system for the Hexagon spy satellite. He's retired now, but he was very proud, and quite rightly so, of the equipment that he helped build and design for the Hexagon spy satellite. The Hexagon spy satellite was necessary following the shooting down of Gary Powers in May 1960, when he was flying over Russia, photographing all their missile sites and bomber squadrons. He got shot down, so President Eisenhower at the time said, right, no more overflights. So they had to get around to doing spy satellites. But the satellites at that time were unmanned, so they had to have a camera that worked automatically. It was a film camera. 
that was used in the Hexagon spy satellite. And almost in passing, the person giving the talk said, well, of course, we had to keep the film pressurized. I thought, what? But keep the film pressurized? I actually asked him to confirm it, he did. He said, yes, film has to be pressurized in a vacuum, otherwise it doesn't work. I then checked out the Hexagon spy satellite itself and found that the camera and the film, there was about three miles of film contained within the Hexagon, and it was all housed in a special pressurized environment. He actually pointed out the nitrogen gas bottle that provided the pressure. All right. And I thought, okay, you've got to pressurize it. Now, I also knew there was another satellite which used photographic film, and that's the Lunar Orbiter. Not the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which photographed potential landing sites for the Apollo craft in 1966, 1967. That used photographic film. All right. We've brought up a lot of points here. Would you be okay if Blue Earth Thing responds to some of those? Yeah, of course, please do. Look, if I'm wrong, I want to know about it. Okay, I just started making a little list of them. The first one, the no viewfinder, when it comes to whether or not they were able to get everything in frame. I can tell you right now, with the camera that I have, I can just take it without a viewfinder and I can get most things in frame most of the time. The astronauts, they weren't highly trained geologists either. These guys, one of their missions was to pick up rocks and everything like that. They had to train for months a long time with geologists to figure out how to just do the basic amount of geology. And I would imagine the same thing would happen with the cameras. They would have to trade a very long time because the cameras are extremely important. These pictures were very important, not only from a PR standpoint, but also from a scientific standpoint to be able to get actual images of the moon that are of really good quality. Another point that I saw you bring up was the adjusting the lenses and the aperture and the focal length and everything like that. If you're standing at the same distance and a lot of these images and some of the ones that you sent are from very similar area, you don't actually have to adjust the lens every time you take a picture. If you're close enough to it, you just take the picture again. With a small aperture and a large depth of field, with a small aperture and a wide angle lens gives you a very large depth of field. I saw that in the chat and um, I forgot who said it. So if you have a large depth of field, you're not really worried about things being out of focus. And the whole thing about the film being in a vacuum. Well, they're not developing the film in the vacuum. And first off, this is hardened film to start with. So this is already film that has gone through special chemical treatment to be hardened. And you're developing it back on Earth once you get back. So the vacuum should not be that big of a problem. In fact, they tested it inside the capsule, I believe, with the color frames and determined that there hasn't been any issue with it while it's on the surface of the moon. There's one thing I want to discuss when it comes to all of this. Let's say that every bit of imagery and film taken on film is fake. We still have TV camera that was not on film from the moon. Okay, let's address that one. Just one point, the film was not developed on Earth on the lunar orbiter. It was developed on the craft. It's a Polaroid type development system. And then the film image was then scanned, transmitted to Earth and reassembled. That's why we saw the pictures. The lunar orbiter is still up there as far as I know. It's, it's not come back to Earth. On Apollo, yes, the films were brought back and developed here on Earth at the Johnson Space Center. The point about the pressure is that the vacuum levels on the moon are vastly greater than in low Earth orbit because the vacuum varies depending on height. The pressure that was required is about one pound per square inch, i.e. not very much. The equivalent of an aircraft flying at 60,000 feet here on Earth. Astronauts could survive at 3.8 pound per square inch, I think was inside their spacesuits, which is more or less the same air pressure you would experience at the top of Mount Everest. Air pressure varies. Sea level is 14.7 pound per square inch and it varies according to height because you've got less air to press down. Mm -hmm. So the idea that vacuum affects photographic film is a fairly well-known feature, fairly well-known fact about film because the film itself outgasses. Now, there's some tests going on right now. I didn't know anything about vacuum affecting film until I heard this talk, I said about 18 months ago. Some people that I'm aware of, know, know, are also are doing testing using vacuum chambers. But there's a problem with that, is that the only commercial vacuum chamber you can buy easily will only achieve the equivalent vacuum at the International Space Station, which is about half the level of vacuum that will occur on the moon. 
And that is a major problem. Because if you can't test for it, how do you know that you don't have a problem? So you Any... can test a camera in a vacuum chamber? Oh, I'm not talking about the camera. I'm talking about the film, the photographic well, film. That, that would also be tested in a vacuum chamber. You sure of that? I would imagine so. Well, that's what everybody thinks. Well, of course they tested it, they'll say, but where is the evidence that they tested photographic film at Tor 10 to the minus 11? That's the vacuum level on the moon. If you can't achieve that here on Earth, and it's very difficult to do that, even the Glenn Research Center in Ohio can't do that. It can do 10 to the minus 7, but not 10 to the minus 11. So what I'm saying is that photographic film, we assume it was tested, but where is the evidence? I don't see it. A lot of people have tried to find that evidence, and they're still trying to find it. And this was done 50 years ago. But when NASA knew that photographic film was damaged by a vacuum, because they put it in a pressurized housing on the only two spacecraft which used photographic film, the implication being that they were aware that photographic film is damaged in a vacuum. So they took steps to ensure that it was okay. So there's a major problem here. Here's the thing that I would say. I don't know much about film. I don't know much about the actual aspects of film. When it comes to radiation, I know that it could have easily survived the radiation, especially the pictures that we did get back that came back. But what I would argue is that it was impossible to fake it. The pictures that we do have show aspects that could not be achieved with the technology that we had at the time. Such as? All right, so let's go to the one of Neil Armstrong standing next to the little thing, I don't have a number for it, but it's Apollo 11 Extra 0307A-5. All you really got to do is just pull up any picture of yours that you have on the moon. It's one of uh, Neil Armstrong standing next to the little thing that he dropped and he's looking at the lunar capsule. It might be Buzz standing there, but the point that I'm trying to make here is you mentioned the inverse square law earlier, and I'm asking, do you know the inverse square law when it refers to light? Same as sound and same as electricity. Yes. So what is producing the light for the scene? That landing module is, what would you say, a couple dozen meters from Buzz? Could be, yeah. So we're looking at a light in which if you look at the ground all the way there, there is no droppage in light. There, no. There's no droppage at all in how bright it is. So we have to have a light that is far enough away and bright enough to make a couple dozen meters, which is not a short distance, irrelevant. And your point is? My point is that that light does not exist. One of the largest lights they had at the time would have been a 20K in a movie studio, which is a massive light. The thing itself is about four feet tall. And let's say this is on one side of the movie studio, and the world's largest movie studio is about 200 meters from one side to the other. So. First thing we'd have to establish is the fact that the movie studios at the time were all accounted for. We don't know what studio this was soundstage this was shot in. Apparently NASA had built one and we don't know what it was. Menlo Park. It's, it's near San Francisco. Yeah, so 1,400 okay. square feet, is that it? Well, that, that's a possibility. I'm not saying it was. It was built okay. originally as an airship hangar. That's what I'm looking at. All right, and cool. It's, it's where Jeff Bezos wants to keep his private plane now. Don't quote me on this, but I think it was where Tom Hanks filmed that miniseries from the Earth to the Moon. All right. Which did reproduce a lot of these images. When you have a 20K light, 20K lights are usually used to mimic the sunlight when it comes to small sets and stuff like that. When you're out at nighttime, you can put it out above. I've seen them put out a top of a shop to make it look like it's daytime on the interior, but they go far and they're bright, but they're still subject to the inverse square law. And they're not bright enough to make a couple dozen meters irrelevant, would be my point. This light that we're having up in these images has to be bright enough to where it is lighting this to the LM and even further out. And you can make an argument that way out past the American flag would be a backdrop. You can make the argument of that, but still, from the LM to the flag, that's still like a dozen meters. So we're looking at potentially 40 meters right here, where it's completely irrelevant 
we see zero change in the brightness of the lunar surface. How is that accomplished from a single light source inside of a studio? Miniatures. Miniatures. So Buzz right here is not standing there, that's a miniature. Could well be. What's the evidence to say that it's a miniature? The evidence actually occurs with the lunar rover. Quite a lot of these pictures of astronauts, I think with two exceptions, you don't see their faces. I mean, you see that the name plate that they've got on their chest, and it says E. Aldrin on that one. But a lot of the other ones, they're further away, and quite a lot of it would appear to be using mannequins, miniatures, and models. Is it possible to tell the difference when you've got a skilled filmmaker using a snorkel camera, which will film, and when projected onto a screen, all the perspectives are correct, and you think that what you're looking at is for real, but it was actually done on a miniature set. I mean, that, that's a fairly well-established technique in Hollywood. Miniatures are pretty impressive, but again, if you can't tell if it's a miniature or not, then that doesn't mean it's a miniature. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean it's not. That would mean that you're the one making the extraordinary claim here, and you would have to prove that's a miniature over just a regular photograph. All right. The only real evidence for that that I've come across is the film of the Lunar Rover, which I think was Apollo 16. It's the Grand Prix, right? That's right. If you look at the astronaut on that Lunar Rover, and there's also a bit of a mystery because they had TV cameras mounted on the Lunar Rover. Mm -hmm. The TV camera by the Lunar Lander and they had a film camera inside the Lunar Lander. Mm -hmm. Hell was filming it. And what were they using? Was it TV or was it film? I don't know the answer to that. It's just a question that I've yet to have answered. The point is that if you look at the astronaut sitting in the Lunar Rover, this thing is bouncing all over the place because it's going quite fast, hence the term Grand Prix. Ah, so, uh, it wasn't. It was not going fast. It was going fast enough so that it was bouncing up and down. Yeah, but I believe it was going less than 15 miles an hour. On a moon that's fast, how do you know they weren't going to hit a sinkhole, a dust bowl? They didn't. But the point is that if you look at the astronaut, his arms are like this and they don't move in the same way that the lunar rover moves, indicating it was almost certainly a mannequin and a radio-controlled model. Could that be because he's gripping something? He's not gripping anything. His arm's right out here, held out. The only thing that the astronaut's hand should be on is the control panel, which is relatively low compared to the way his arm is in that point. It's a stick. It's a sort of tiller where he can change the direction of it using it. It was a very clever piece of kit assuming it worked the way we were told. Can I address the lunar rover? Because I actually have a couple points. So in order to make the lunar rover a miniature, that means that we're dealing with a remote controlled car, correct? Correct. Okay. So miniatures in photography is pretty different from miniatures when they're moving in on film and stuff like that. This does not strike me as a miniature in any way. Addressing the arm holding up there. These are bulky suits that are really hard to move in. In fact, we just had to improve the suits because the suits were too hard to move in. Okay, so yes, the arm is being held up, not holding anything. But I want to say real quick, I do have a lot of experience when it comes to driving, when it comes to bumpy driving, particularly. And right. it's not that difficult to keep your body still, especially if you're secured in a suit that is very bulky. That arm wouldn't be moving that much. Again, I would argue that these are highly trained astronauts, and I'm not sure, I'm, I've never been to the moon, so I don't know this for sure, but it could be a way of keeping your balance. It could be your arm is being held there in order to keep you in balance. It could be that the suit itself is bulky, and it's hard to move the arm. It'd take a lot of inertia to get it to move up and down. Since they're on one-sixth the gravity of Earth, there wouldn't be that much force acting on the person. You just made one very important point. They're in one six gravity. Okay. Let's say the average person weighs, what, 180 pounds. Let's go for that. I would, wearing... I would argue that the astronauts would probably be weighing about 200 pounds because they do have some muscle. All right, 200 pounds. Okay. Yes. On the moon, they're going to weigh a sixth of that. They've got a backpack on, which apparently weighs about the same as they do. So in effect, 
no matter what they weigh, they will weigh one third of their weight on Earth. It's not the weight that is necessarily the amount of problem, it's the flexibility of the materials. He weighed 360 pounds in 17% gravity? Yes. Come on. He weighed up 360 pounds on Earth. Armstrong wasn't a big person. But what we're talking about is the weight they weigh on the moon. What's the answer they give there? 360 pounds. Now that is wrong. That is completely incorrect. I will read this quick. A backpack weighs 60 newtons, 13 pounds on Earth. Neil Armstrong's total mass was about 160 kilograms with spacesuit and backpack. The moon did not pull as hard on him as the Earth did, so he weighed less on the moon. At the surface, the moon's gravitational pull is only 17%. On Earth, with his heavy spacesuit and backpack, Neil Armstrong weighed about 1,600 newtons. He weighed 360 pounds here on Earth, so answer with his suit and backpack, Neil Armstrong weighed about 270 pounds on the moon. Let's say that Armstrong weighed 150 pounds. Let's say his backpack weighed 150 pounds on Earth. That's 300 pounds on Earth. On the moon, it's one sixth of that weight. I, instead of 300 pounds on Earth, he would weigh about 50 or 60 pounds on the moon, or the equivalent thereof, because of less gravity. The point I'm making is that though his energy will be the same, he will appear to weigh considerably less. And therefore, there will be less friction between his boots and the surface. It will be as if he is walking on ice. Ice.